This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from three Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Dan Bordelotti, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital, and Mark McGrath, Associate Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. Ben, I thought you were going to introduce yourself as Chief Investment Officer now. Uh, I'll, I'll tweak that for the next intro, Mark. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Got to gotta keep you happy. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> So welcome to episode 329. Uh, Today we do a deep dive on the RESP, the Registered Education Savings Plan in Canada. This is one of those episodes where the topic is pretty Canadian. Um, We have those from time to time because we are in fact Canadian. Uh, But we do go through some what I think are pretty interesting optimization scenarios even if they don't have direct corollaries to whatever country you may be in, I think there's still some interesting stuff in there. We also talk about asset allocation as it relates to time horizon for this account type. Uh, and then we have a, an interesting sort of philosophical discussion about government savings programs and incentives at the end. So, so hopefully our non-Canadian audience still finds the discussion useful, but you know, disclaimer up front, it is a pretty Canadian topic. And then, uh, we do hope you stick around for the after show where we have a bit of a meatier discussion than usual for an after show uh, because there is this discussion in the Rational Reminder community that just, it, it just blew up. It was really interesting to watch actually. Um, a couple people started to really go on out of topic and then a bunch more people chimed in. Larry Swedrow is in there with a bunch of posts. Like it was, it was neat to see. I think it's up to like uh, almost 340 posts on that topic now, but it kind of kicked off in the Sunil Wahal uh, episode discussion and it was all about expected returns. What is an expected return? What determines an expected return? Uh, anyway, so a bit, bit of a re not really, not really a recap, but some comments on that discussion in the after show. Yeah. Um, it's good. I think the after show might be as long as the, no, it's not the, the main <laughs> time. <laughs> and we will have the same audience, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I did want to mention that if you're enjoying the podcast, we would love it if you told one person about it that maybe doesn't already listen. I mean, hopefully doesn't already listen. That would kind of defeat the point if they already did. <laughs> uh, you could maybe pick an episode that you think might be useful to that person and share it with them. Uh, but the audience that we have is a huge part of why we keep doing the podcast. And I think it makes the whole just ecosystem more interesting when we have all of these audience members who are engaging with the content. So we, we hope that keeps growing. And uh, yeah, if you could share it with someone that has not listened before, we would appreciate it. All right. Ready to go to the episode? Yep. Ready to go. So we're talking about uh, optimal education savings withdrawals and asset allocation. Uh, in Canada, we have this, this account called the RESP, the Registered Education Savings Plan. Uh, It's existed since 1974, and I don't think it's changed a ton over that period, but Dan, you're going to talk about later. Yeah, exactly. Maybe since 1974, but not really much since 1994. Yeah, 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 yeah. there's been some. I I was actually looking into this yesterday. I think the only change that I noticed was that there used to be no limit on, and we're going to get into this, but there used to be no limit on contributions prior to something like 1989, and then they started Mm -hmm. adding all these caps to it, and the caps haven't changed much since, which I think is what you're referring to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that as, as the name of the account suggests, it's intended to help with funding post-secondary education costs. The definition of post-secondary education is very broad. Uh, the way that it works is contributions to the account are made with after-tax dollars. Uh, and then there are matching grants that get paid into the account when certain contributions are made. Not on all contributions, there are some limits, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then inside of the account, just like with other account types like an RSP or a TFSA, once you put money in there, you can invest it most, most of the time. Depends where you open it, I guess. Uh, but if you open it at a brokerage, you can invest in stocks or whatever inside of the, uh, of the account. And the, the, the benefit of the RSP is that all of the growth in the account is tax deferred. Uh, there, are, there are grants too. I mean, that's part of the benefit. But uh, for investing, the benefit is that the growth is tax deferred. And as long as the beneficiary enrolls in post-secondary education, qualifying post-secondary education, that growth is taxable to the beneficiary when it's withdrawn. So if it's like a parent funding the account, stuff is growing tax deferred in the account. And then if the child enrolls in a qualifying program, uh, the the growth is taxable in the child's hands. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. which is pretty beneficial uh, in a lot of cases. Well, it's one of the only income splitting, really. Exactly. It's one of the only it's exa- right. income splitting tools we have, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I think one of the common misconceptions uh, with RESPs is that you buy an RESP from the sales organizations that kind of chase you down in the hospital right after you've had a child. And uh, that's happened to me, like, you know, with someone who has a little bit of financial knowledge, seeing it happen in real time was pretty interesting, but you're like, you just had a baby, like just had a baby. And they come in with a folder that has information. And part of that information is like, sign up for this thing. How long Uh, ago was that, Ben? Like when was your, your child born? Because I know that was definitely the case 25 years ago, but I'm saddened to hear that it's still happening. Well, most recently, yeah. my youngest the kid is uh, four. So uh, yeah. as recently as yeah, uh, that's as that. That's pretty shameful. It, it's funny because I was uh, my daughter's 18 months now. And I, was, I was actually hoping this would happen to me because I've heard so many people. Just it, so it, you it, had it an anecdote? Yeah. Totally, yeah. And just so I could like <laughs> roast them in the hospital about why they shouldn't be doing this to me when my wife's just given birth, but it never happened. It might have changed. Uh, I, I seem to remember there might have been a... Uh, a legal case. I, I don't know. I, I can't mm-hmm. remember, but it, I, I have a feeling that it might've changed uh, more recently. Uh, but that, that is a common misconception that like that's what an RESP is, but an RESP is just an account type. That is one way of accessing the account type is through these things called uh, group RESPs or pooled RESPs. Uh, they, they've got a bunch of downsides that I think we'll comment on a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Uh, you can open this account anytime after the birth of the beneficiary. You need a social insurance number to, to do it. Uh, and then the person opening the account is called the subscriber. So they legally own the account, which is, that's important for, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, usually a parent or a guardian. Uh, could be a spouse. Could be anyone. It, with an individual or ESP, there's, no, actually, there's actually no restriction on who you can open it for. There's different types, which we'll get into as family RESPs and individual RESPs, but, but I mean, most commonly, yes, it's going to be parents or grandparents opening it for children, right? Yep. And then there's a lifetime contribution limit, $50,000 per beneficiary. Uh, that can go in at any time. Like there's no annual limit on contributions. Um, but where it gets interesting is that there are grants. So when you make a contribution, uh, you, you do receive grants in certain cases and those have an annual, uh, an annual cap. So you get 20% of the contributed amount up to a maximum of, of $500 per year. So that's $2,500 Con- contribution gets the max grant for that year. And then if you keep contributing, you don't get more grants. If you have unused grants, you can mop up one past year of unused grant at a time. Um, uh, yeah. And the, then the total lifetime amount of grant is $7,200. Uh, and then there are some programs where you, you can get a little bit of an accelerated grant if you have an, an income below uh, a certain threshold, but your lifetime grant amount is still uh, is still the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want to you want to explain the Canada Learning Bond, Mark? Sure. Yeah. So there's the Canada Learning Bond, which is for children of what the government considers to be low income families. So it doesn't requ- it's not a matching contribution. It's basically just a deposit by the government, um, but it does require an RESP to be open in order to to receive it. Um, but you don't have to make a contribution. So it's a, effectively a free deposit from the government for those under certain income levels. Do you know what the income level is? For the bond? Yeah, for the Canada not, Learning not, Bond. Not I don't have it offhand. Yet, no. Okay, maybe no. we can look it up. I can look it up after. But um, Different provinces also have grants. Like I'm in BC and we recently, like in the past 10 years or so, introduced something called the BC Training and Education Savings Grant, I think it is. And so that is for children who are, I think they have to be older than six years old to get it. And it's just an application, uh, as long as they're six or over, I think. Uh, And it's a $1,200 boost. It's a free $1,200 deposit to the RESP, which is a great incentive. I think Quebec has one. Um, I think, Ben, you looked at this, or Dan, maybe you looked at this in Alberta and Saskatchewan used to have them, but they've discontinued them. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. There are a couple of other provinces have had them. And I think what they've realized is, you know, they were really quite small. So they would Mm. throw in a few hundred dollars. And I'm sure they felt that the cost of the administration Mm. just didn't merit it. It wasn't really, um, you know, adding enough value. Yeah. Um, Just to, to backtrack on the BC one, if I remember correctly, you have to apply for it when the child is older than six, but younger than nine. Right. And, yeah, good point. yeah. So there's a bit of a window in there. And I know like for our clients here, 
you know, we put their birthdays in the calendar that pops up as soon as they turn six. And then we reach out and apply for the grant for yep. that reason. Cause if you, if you forget and your kid is over mm. nine, you missed the opportunity. So it's weird, isn't it? Like it is strange. <laughs> why pick a three year window arbitrarily between six and nine? Like yeah. it's still a decade before they're actually going to use the money for anything. It's just kind of seems like an odd way to administer that. But well, these plans are so complex. It just, it's sort of par for the course that the, provinces add their own level of complexity onto them yeah fair enough so that, that was we have, we have federal grants matching grants you have to make a contribution we have a bond uh, uh, which you get based on your income level but it's not contributory you don't have to make a contribution but you have to have an income below a certain level and you have to open the RESP account to get it and then two provinces bc and quebec have additional grants uh, are, are those matching grants like they're contributory? No, I mean the BC one is definitely not. Yeah, okay. you just happen to have you just have to have an RESP open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and to be clear, the CLB, the Canada Learning Bond, it's not a huge. Um, like, I mean, it's, it's money, right? But um, I think it's uh, is it five hundred dollars for the first year, and then a hundred dollars per year after that, up to age fifteen, as long as you continue to qualify from a family income perspective. So at the most, you're getting two thousand dollars over fifteen years. Right. Um, which I mean, for obviously for a low income family who's going to have trouble saving for education, that's it, it's money, right? But it's not a, a huge. I, Dan, you're going to get into this later, but the cost of education is high, and two thousand dollars is not likely to be the difference between somebody being able to achieve post secondary education and not, right? Right. Yep. Another nuance with a plan is that blood relatives or legally adopted relatives can share what's called a family RESP. Uh, beneficiaries, beneficiaries have to be under 21 to be added to a family plan. But with a, a family RESP, it's the same deal. Like you get access to the same grants per child. And while the use of grants is limited per child, like you can only withdraw up to $7,200 of grant per child, any excess earnings in the account, that's earnings on contributions and earnings on grants, that part can be distributed to any one child within mm -hmm. a family plan. So yeah. with a family that has multiple children, uh, the, the family plan, I think is generally just a little bit more flexible in terms of how the money can be used to, to fund education for the, for the kids. Yeah. More flexible, but more confusing. For yeah. More, confusing. more complex. For sure. Dan, did you have a family plan for your kids? You said they're grown up. No, we had individual plans, um, but we manage virtually all family plans for our clients yeah. just because they're easier administratively but we do this every day for uh, people who are trying to manage their own RESP, trying to keep track of how much contributions, grants, and growth is allocated yeah. to each child in the plan is not that straightforward. So sure. it's it definitely takes a little bit of experience to be able to manage those competently. Yeah. yeah. Ben, you've you yeah, got four kids. You presumably got a family RESP. Yeah, we have it set up as a, as a family plan. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you can manage the complexity, Ben. <laughs> it's tricky. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, my my PWL advisor that helps me with all that stuff can manage it. I, I, uh, okay. So the, so we have these uh, the stuff going into the account. We have contributions. We have grants. We have bonds. We have investment returns, which are not being taxed, but will eventually be taxed in the hands of the beneficiary. And all of those individual sort of notional accounts, I guess you could call them, that exist inside of the RESP, they actually matter quite a lot for how it comes out, how the money comes out of the account. So if if a beneficiary enrolls in a qualifying educational program, the grants and growth are paid out as what are called education assistant assistance payments, EAPs. Those are taxed in the hands of the student. Mm -hmm. Now for a student who has you know probably a low income, probably some tuition tax credits, they're not gonna pay much tax. On, uh, on those withdrawals. However, if they have a high paying uh, co-op job or something like that, they could end up paying a lot of tax. So mm -hmm. we'll walk through some withdrawal, sort of a, a little case study later, but uh, you do have to be a little bit cautious of the timing of withdrawals of the taxable portion of the uh, RESP. Mm -hmm. This and isn't the, a problem anymore because of the new tax on split income rules, but it used to be where Again, I primarily primarily worked with doctors, and most of them have corporations. And you used to be able to add your children as shareholders of your corporation. Mm -hmm. At least in BC, there's bylaws per per province. But in BC, you would have children's 
children subscribing for shares of the corporation when they're kids. And then when they turn adults, you could just pay them dividends. So you could just split income from your company. It doesn't matter if they worked there or anything. So a lot of physicians had set up their corporations to pay dividends to their adult kids for school. So you used to have to manage the taxes on the RESP a lot more uh, intricately because they had this, this other taxable income. That opportunity has largely gone away. But um, yeah, now to your point, Ben, everyone's got about $15,000 of tax-free income they can earn per year. You stack on the tuition tax credits. And it's often possible to get a lot of that RESP money out with little to no tax. Yeah. Uh, and then the the uh, contributions that you put in there, so the grants and the growth are taxable. Those are EAPs. The contributions are PSEs. I find I find all the names to make this whole thing just like that much more complex. Like there are all yeah. these ridiculous acronyms for the types of withdrawals that are coming out. It's like, just the structure of the withdrawals is complicated enough, but then we have these acronyms for them too. It's just like, man, this is, this well, is ridiculous. Not only that, but the acronyms both kind of mean the same thing, don't they? Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say the acronyms don't education really payment, like, yeah, distinguish between <laughs> contributions yeah. and growth. They both essentially are synonymous. So yeah, it yeah. makes well, no sense. Taxable and tax-free. Like, make it yeah. easy, guys. But it actually matters for, for how useful the account is. Like, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't make the account useful. That's what I mean, but it, to, for it to be useful, you have to properly manage all of these different uh, notional accounts inside of the uh, inside of the account. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, you can make contributions to the RESP until 31 years after it was first open, and then you have until the 35th year after the plan was first open to use the funds before the account expires, uh, and, and that would have implications for how the money comes out as well. And if it's not used to fund post secondary education then there are a sort of another set of, of implications. Uh, the contributions that you put in there still come out tax-free, so that's, that's nice. The grants are repaid to the government, and then the access, which is the earnings on the contributions and the grants, you can transfer some of that to your RRSP if you have room. You don't get additional room to put it in there. Uh, and as long as all remaining beneficiaries are at least 21 years old, uh, and the plan's been open for at least 10 years. So yeah. it's not like super simple like, hey you can no. just do this and it's a fifty thousand dollar cap per subscriber i believe on what you can roll over into an rsp which is actually mm. really interesting and favors joint jointly owned resps right like if you have mm. like my wife and i are both joint subscribers on our kids resps that gives us a hundred thousand dollars of potential growth that could be rolled into rsps if you're a single subscriber then you only have fifty thousand for the family that can be that can be used that way hmm. now, there it's are some other cap, provisions what's that it's, it's a pretty high cap fifty thousand dollars of growth but still yeah, for sure. Uh, if the beneficiary doesn't go to school uh, or, or if they have a disability and don't use the RESP, uh, the earnings can, in certain cases, be rolled into an RDSP, a Registered Disability Savings Plan. Uh, and then if if you have to take the money out, so you can put it into an RRSP if you have room, up to $50,000 per subscriber. You can put it into an RDSP if certain conditions are met. Uh, but if you can't do either of those things, then the excess amount, the earnings, uh, have to come out at your tax rate plus a 20% penalty, which is basically to account for the growth from uh, invested grants. Like you earned money on grants that you know you had to pay back. Uh, and you also had this tax sheltered growth benefit. So there's a penalty applied to, I guess, uh, sort of account for that. Yep. Could be a lot of tax. That's like... 73.5%, I guess, would be the top tax rate in BC. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. But as you know, we've talked about, the, these are pretty theoretical. It's extremely rare for a parent to be put in a position where they have to do this. Yeah. There's yeah. enough other sort of exit strategies that that's really the last resort. Yeah. yeah. And I think you can just donate the money to you. I've never seen it, but I believe there's a clause that says you can also just donate that money to a registered uh, educational institution of some kind. And I'm presumably there's no tax to you. I don't know if you get any sort of tax credits or anything like that. You but. don't, you don't get a tax. I've seen it happen once and it doesn't, you don't even get a tax benefit. So. Jeez. Uh, so these, these accounts are, I mean, like it seems unnecessarily complex, but you know, it is what it is. Um, but because they're, they're complex and because they have all these funny little features, it, it turns out to be a pretty fun sort of optimization problem to play with. Like if you have a child, if you've just had a child and you have $50,000 that you could invest in an RESP account, keeping in mind that 50,000 is the lifetime maximum contribution limit, 
should you dump that $50,000 into the RESP and invest it? Or should you contribute it gradually over time to maximize the matching grants? Mm -hmm. Just keep in mind, if you do 50,000 once, you get one year of matching grant, but there's a cap for that year. And yeah. now you're done. You have no more contribution room. Yeah. So you give up no a bunch grants. of grants. Or you could contribute gradually over time to get all the grants. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's kind of fun to play with. Have you seen clients do that? I've, I've had one client do that, dump 50 grand in day one. This would have been 2016 or so. And so in hindsight, that looks really, really good. But Probably worked out most, great. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think he went 100% into VEQT, 100% at global equity. So it's worked out very, very well for him. But I think most people aren't in a position to do that. That's the only one I've seen do it. Yeah, interesting. We do, the, we do a hybrid uh, strategy very frequently where we put in the 14,000 lump sum that's the difference between the maximum contribution and the maximum amount that you need to collect the lifetime maximum grant. So you put in 14,000 the year the child is born and 2,500 every year going forward, you get the maximum grant and you get extra compounding on that original 14,000. Maybe that's a, you know, and I don't know if it's optimal, but it's certainly a strategy that oh, seems it is. to make intuitive sense. Yeah. It's optimal, Dan. I'm, we're okay. we're going to talk about that exact oh, strategy. The gun. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We, uh, yeah, no, it's a, uh, that, that is, opt, optimal is hard to define here, but I, I think that is probably overall, when you consider a bunch of different stuff, that's probably the, the optimal strategy. Um, but we'll, we'll talk through a couple different, a uh, couple different examples here. Uh, so if, if we assume that other registered accounts are maxed out, so TFSA is maxed out, RSP is maxed out. Um, so while this $50,000 is waiting to be invested in the RESP, it's invested in a taxable account, taxed at the highest rate in Ontario in, uh, in these examples. So I've got one little mini case here from Aaron Hector, who's a financial planner that uh, we, we know pretty well, and uh, he's, he's, he's brilliant. Uh, but he, he did a post on, on, uh, on, on exactly this, where he looked at a 7% return as his base case, and he did look at a couple of different scenarios, but 7% return is the base case and he actually found that a four-year funding plan was optimal, which is interesting. So that was putting in 42500 in the first year and then following that with three years of $2,500 contributions to make, up the, uh, to make up the room. So it's even a different hybrid than, than your example, Dan. Mm -hmm. um, and then he looked at a bunch of different return scenarios. And in general, in his return scenarios, what, what you see is higher returns make front-loading look better. So like your example, Mark, of dumping the 50,000 and just getting great mm -hmm. returns, that's, that's going to look better than getting grants. Uh, and then if you have lower returns, uh, the, the grants are, are more attractive because they're obviously guaranteed. Like you get those regardless of how low your returns end up being. So in, in Aaron's example, with a 7% return and a bit of variation around that, uh, it, it makes, he, he kind of finds that front loading looks pretty good. I, I did a model pretty similar to Aaron's. Uh, this is what I did this last last year. I posted it on on Twitter, uh, but I added a Monte Carlo uh, simulation because I wanted to see the distribution of outcomes for the different strategies. I didn't do exactly what Aaron did. Aaron did a bunch of different variations of the multi year funding. I just did the fifty thousand dollars or the one you mentioned, Dan, where you do the the fourteen thousand up front and then uh, and then the rest after that. Uh, and then I looked at the terminal wealth. At age, at age 18. So with a 7% return, similar to what Aaron found, I also found that front loading makes a lot of sense if you get a guaranteed 7% return, which you, you can't get right now. Uh, but when I ran it through the Monte Carlo, what I found is that the median ending wealth was lower for the front loaded strategy and the standard deviation of final after tax wealth was much higher for the front loaded strategy. So my kind of take on this is that once you adjust for risk, I think it's pretty hard to argue against getting all of the grants. Like, yes, you can show that front loading makes a lot of sense if you if you can get a really high return, but because returns are not guaranteed, I, I, I think it's pretty hard to say that it doesn't make sense to go for the grants unless you're really risk seeking, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the grants are a hedge against the worst outcomes, right, effectively. Correct. Over time, That's it's the it. difference between con investing twenty five hundred dollars a year and three thousand per year over that time frame. So if you get lucky with your returns, like the client that I had, like great. Um, 
But if you had done this in, I don't know, going into 1999 or something where we faced two massive bear markets and right. within a decade, like those grants in hindsight would probably have been really, really useful to be, to, to be allocated. So it's, um, yeah, I think it just improves the worst case scenarios by, by getting the grants. So we, we did the same thing like with our kids. We did that exact strategy that Dan described where we put in the 14,000. And, and, you know, I mean, not everybody can do this, of course. I respect that. But in my mind, the best strategy is to try to get the additional $14,000 in as soon as possible. And if it takes five or seven years to do that, that's fine. But you've got time on your side to, to some degree by allowing that money to compound. So if you can't do it year one, that's that's fine. But try to spread it out. But you can contribute more than the $2,500 per year that you need to get the grants. Yeah. Yeah. And you make a good point though, Mark, that you want to get that unassisted contribution as they call it, that $14,000 that you, you don't obtain a grant. You don't want to put that in when your child is 13 or 14. Mm. It, I mean, you can, but I just think that it's not worth it at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. You might as well either try to get it in early. And if you don't have the funds available, just get in the 36,000 that you need to get the maximum grant. And as we'll talk about a little later, that's going to be enough for a lot of people. Like that's going to get you very close to, um, you know, the full amount that you would need to fund a four year undergrad education in, in many cases. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yep. Yeah. So we do that, that, that $14,000 front loading strategy. We do that, uh, for clients all the time, like, mm -hmm. like you guys do, Dan. And, uh, we, we call it, uh, we call it RESP super funding. That's our nickname for it. <laughs> okay. If you have non-registered funds available, it's yeah. a great idea, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, okay. So the other side of the RESP that I think gets typically less attention than optimal contributions, which even itself is a pretty niche topic, but uh, even less attention is paid toward uh, withdrawals. So we mentioned some of the nuances around the different types of uh, notional accounts that exist inside the RASP. Uh, but th th there's this question of, okay, so you you do this, you 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 find the optimal contribution strategy, and you end up with a big pile of money in your RASP. Now what do you do? Uh, so Aaron Hector did another post on this, and I did ask Aaron for permission to talk about these posts for the for the record. He was totally cool with it. Uh, so there, there there are two types of post secondary withdrawals. There's the EAPs, the educational assistance payments, which are taxable, and that's from your investment returns and your and your grants, uh, taxable to the beneficiary, assuming they're enrolled in a qualifying post-secondary education program. Uh, oh, and they are fully taxed as income. Like there's no, yeah. no there's no idea of dividends or capital gains or whatever. It's all mm -hmm. 100 percent taxes income. Uh, and then we have the PSEs, the, the non-taxable withdrawals. Those acronyms still just drive me. They just drive me nuts. <laughs> yep. uh, and, and you have a choice. You can choose between taking out EAP or PSE. Uh, so the, the, there, there are some limits on the EAP. It's limited to $8,000 in the first 13 weeks of enrollment in a full-time program or $4,000 if, if it's a part-time program. And then after the first 13 weeks, there is still a limit, which is kind of interesting. If you stay under the limit, your financial institution is not expected to assess the reasonableness of the expenses. And if you go over the limit, then your financial institution may ask questions about, is this a reasonable educational cost? Uh, so that limit for 2024 is $28,122. Yeah. That's really interesting because it's up to the promoter. It's up to the, the financial institution to determine whether it's, it's reasonable at the end of the day. Uh, well, to, it, it, it does raise the question though, like, first of all, what's reasonable? Second yeah. of all, um, if you just happen to have, you know, very high investment returns in your RSP and you end up, you have no choice but to withdraw these larger EAPs, why would you be, like, what, what is the consequence if you try to take a $40,000 EAP and the limit is 28? Mm -hmm. You can't generate receipts showing that you spent forty thousand dollars for your child's education. I I've never seen that happen. I'm just curious as to what what consequences there would be. Can the financial institution say, "Yeah, sorry, we're not allowing you to withdraw your money because you exceeded, you know, the limit that we've set"? Yeah, I don't actually know. That'd be, that'd be an interesting question to ask uh, somebody that runs one of these programs at a financial institution. 
Yeah. If anyone knows, leave a comment. Yeah. yeah. I, and I think CRA can audit these. So even if a school or a financial institution rather says it's reasonable, CRA does have the the right to audit all of these. So you mm. could get, even if you took out 40 grand, the let's say your financial institution says it's reasonable. In theory, CRA can audit your transaction and then you would have to submit further proof of that. And then CRA does maintain, I don't know if it's CRA or the ESDC, but they, they maintain a list of expenses that are considered reasonable versus not reasonable, right? right? And so something that's interesting is rent to live on campus, like housing is a reasonable expense, but not down payments on property. Mm-hmm. And this is just with respect to the EAP limit, this taxable limit. So I've actually seen a case where somebody took out the full amount of PSE, their taxable, uh, non-taxable contributions that they've made. And they use that to buy a condo on campus and then charge their child rent using the EAP withdrawals as, as rent for the condo. And then when they finished university, they just gifted them the property. Um, so there's like, I think there's creative ways uh, around it, but it's like, it's a problem that I think very few people will end up facing. And I mean, the three of us have never seen a case, I guess, where somebody's needed to make a uh, withdrawal in excess of $28,000 per per semester or it's per year, I guess that limit, right? Per year. Yeah. Per year. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we've come close to that. I mean, it's not that unusual, Mm. you know, for if you supercharge your RESP and you earn healthy investment returns for 18 years, you could end up with well over a hundred thousand dollars in an RESP. And that might require you to take out $28,000 in a year. Um, That's not an extraordinary amount. Um, but certainly I, we have never been challenged for taking too large of an EAP. So no, yeah. no. And it can yeah. happen when you have multiple kids and then one doesn't go to school, that growth has to be spread out amongst the other children. Right. So that larger amount of growth, the more kids you have. Um, so like Ben, if two of your kids don't go to school, you're going to have all this excess growth that has to be distributed to the two that do go to school. Yeah. Well, I, I have a feeling your kids, I have a feeling your kids are going to go to school then. I hope so. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. It's it's also so broad though. Like, what qualifies as post secondary uh, programs? Like, it can be trades. It can be I don't yeah. know, like beauty beautician school. Like, it's, it's just a, there's a huge list of qualifying programs. It, it's almost anything. Like, the qualifier <laughs> is that the program has to be. So I was going to tell the story later, but I'll tell it now. The the qualifier is that the program has to be at least three weeks in length. So I had a, a client once, and they had a child that was going to take a two week bartending course. Okay, and this was a, it was a couple thousand dollar course. It was two weeks in length, but then there was a one week study period <laughs> and then there is a final exam so from start to finish from the day you you start that program to the day you write the exam is three weeks even though there's actually two weeks of instruction and um, the sdc maintains a list of qualified educational institutions so if you're ever curious about a program as to whether it would qualify for an resp mm-hmm. withdrawal you can just go look that up and it's not just canadian institutions by the way you can use this for for uh, institutions outside of canada Anyways, of course, we look it up. The bartending school is not on the list of approved schools. And I was able to call ESDC and say, hey, here's the scenario. And the program is two weeks, but there's a one week study period. And then the exam, can we make an RESP withdrawal? And they approved it. So anytime I get people saying like, oh, well, it's so restrictive. And like, what if my kid doesn't go to school? I'm like, anything they do to further themselves and any kind of career path is yeah. likely to qualify for an RESP withdrawal. Like you just don't really have to worry about it. If they, if they become a rock star and never go to school, okay, that's one thing, but I've yet to see a scenario where like we couldn't find something for them to do for a month to get the RESP money out. Right. Yeah. That's very encouraging because I'm, I'm really happy to hear that they're that flexible about what they consider to be post-secondary education. And it's not this narrow minded college or university or that's it. Um, yep. so that's, that's a good story. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, okay. Now, so th- thinking about how to withdraw properly or efficiently matters because we have this mix of taxable and non-taxable, uh, amounts inside of the account. We have limits on withdrawals, certain limits like we were just discussing. And then we have this issue where once the beneficiary is no longer enrolled, uh, you, you, it's, it's much less efficient because you have that penalty, uh, tax and the grants have to be paid back. Uh, so you really want to get this right. Um, not to mention stuff like tuition tax credits while the kids enrolled in, uh, in, in school. So what Aaron did in his post here 
is he looked at a case where an RESP has $50,000 of PSE. So that's $50,000 of contributions and $150,000 of EAP. So that's grants and, and growth. So we've got a $200,000 RESP account and Aaron just maps out how, what, what should you take out and when and what it's actually look like. So in the fall semester uh, of the first year of enrollment in, in a qualifying post-secondary educational institution, Aaron shows taking uh, $15,000 out as a non-taxable PSE. And he's going to put that in the TFSA and the FHSA, the first home savings account of the, of the student. And then he suggest, suggests taking out $8,000 as an EAP. Uh, so that's the taxable amount. And that's the limit for the first 13 weeks of enrollment. And that's going to pay for whatever educational costs and stuff like that. Uh, and then in December of that year, so now 13 weeks have passed, Aaron suggests taking out $20,122 which is the balance to get to that EAP threshold, the 28,122 for the year. And that's it for that year. And then in January, so the, the first winter semester of the first year, uh, we have $15,000 taken out as a PSE again, and that goes again into the TFSA and the FHSA. And then a $28,122 EAP, or whatever the maximum amount happens to be in that year. And he kind of does the same thing, cycles through a couple more times uh, eventually the PSE is all used up. There's a final EAP for the 28,122. But then there's an interesting piece at the end where in Aaron's case, there was still a chunk left of EAP that, so the students done their program now, uh, there was still a bunch of EAP left about, there's like, I think it was $9,000 or something that couldn't come out under that $28,122 limit. So Aaron's like, okay, well, this is a bit of a problem because now we would have to be able to justify the expense. So in his case, what he does is use it to purchase a vehicle, which would qualify as an, uh, as an excess for an excess EAP withdrawal, uh, as long as the student's using it for transportation to and from school, which is kind of, kind of an interesting little, little point in there. Um, and so in Aaron's case, the student ends up with, they, they've paid for a, a good chunk of their education costs. They've also got a maxed out FHSA and they've shoveled $35,000 into their TFSAs their, their TFSA. Uh, and yeah, so I, I, I think it's an interesting case and I think it ties into asset allocation for RESPs, which we're going to talk about, uh, a little bit later, because in this case, a bunch of the money that was in the RESP has now gone into other investment accounts that could be used for long-term investments as opposed to mm -hmm. spent on education costs. Yep. Yeah. yeah right. There's a lot of moving parts in here. I guess the one, the one thing that jumps out to me is that you're contributing to the FHSA, presumably in years where your income is very low, mm -hmm. probably don't want to deduct those contributions and carry those, that deduction yep. room forward, right? Yeah, yep. totally. The FHSA for people who aren't familiar is the new first home savings account, right? So it combines the benefits of RSPs and TFSAs in, in some ways. So when you contribute to that account, you get, you can use that to reduce your income. But you, like an RSP, you can contribute to it, but you don't have to use that income deduction in the year you contribute. So down to your point, in those low income years, you probably don't want to use that deduction, carry it forward to a year when you have a, a higher income, right? Um, the other thing is that limit, that $28,122, that's indexed to inflation, I believe. That's one of the few things that is actually indexed to inflation with RESPs. Because I remember looking at that number a few years ago and it was something like 24000 So it has obviously gone up and I assume it's indexed to CPI, um, the consumer price index. But... Aaron's example, I don't think, obviously accounted for growth on any remaining investments or any investment income. So there would be like maybe residual income built up in the plan because you're going to leave it in a savings account of some kind, maybe as, as this is happening. But on the flip side, that EAP limit is also going up by inflation each year. So it's a very, very fascinating scenario. But down to your part, to your point, quite complex. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> you know, I sometimes like to start with the simple scenario where you assume that the RESP is just going to be withdrawn in order to pay for um, school related costs and not used to fund these other accounts. And one of the strategies that you know, we will often consider is try to get those EAPs out as early as possible. Yeah. I mean, obviously you don't want to load up the student with um, income that's eventually going to be taxable. But the reason for that is if the child finishes a year or two of school and then drops out and doesn't go back. And we all know this happens frequently. You might end up in a position where you have to pay back those grants and face all of those penalties that we talked about. If you get all the EAPs out 
And at the end, all you have left is contributions. You can take those out anytime, even if the child no longer is enrolled in school. And I have seen this happen. Mm -hmm. I've just experienced it with clients. So it's not a, you know, zero risk yeah, uh, strategy. So I would say, you know, as far as possible, up to the limit where you where you're pretty confident the student's not going to pay any taxes, get those EAPs out in the first couple of years if you can. Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, but I mean, some like I've got clients who have students that are that enter co-op programs in year three and four, and they make twenty, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars, right? So the probability of their income having other sources of taxable income, I find, goes up in the later years of a program. So you want ideally, from just a pure tax perspective, less EAPs withdrawn in later years than in, in earlier years, right? Crazy. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a super interesting topic. There's a few other fun things about our ESPs that we didn't cover um, before we get into some of the other stuff. Um, I mentioned quickly they can be used for qualifying programs outside of Canada. So that's another thing that I find people who are um, maybe wary of, of or concerned about our ESP usage. They don't realize that. You can use them for certain educational programs outside the country, which is great. There are over-contribution penalties to be aware of, and this can get hairy when you've got... Um, multiple RESPs for one beneficiary. So I've seen cases where grandparents open an RESP for a child, for their, their grandkid. The parents also open one. Both are contributing. The beneficiary is the one that has those limits. That 50000 lifetime limit and the $7,200 grant limit is per beneficiary, not per plan. So if you've got multiple RESPs with the same beneficiaries, it's very easy to it's very difficult to strategize properly to, to optimize the way that we've we've explained here, and you can run into situations where you uh, inadvertently over contribute to the plan. So you have to be careful. And if you do, there's a one percent penalty per month, much like an RSP and a TFSA, on any excess contributions. The weird difference, and I don't know why this is, but somebody actually pointed this out to me on Twitter last year. With a TFSA, for example, the moment you over contribute to a TFSA, the penalty applies for that month. So even if it's in there for an hour, in theory you have to pay that month's penalty on the TFSA over contribution. With an RESP, that's not the case. The RESP, they actually look at the month end. So as long as you've withdrawn the excess contribution before the end of the month, which just brought up a really ridiculous strategy that I would never recommend to anybody. But I guess in theory, you could just like the second day of the month, invest the money in the RESP, take it out on day 28, not pay the penalty and put it in on the first or the second of the next month. Don't do this. It just occurred to me. But as yeah, don't try this at home, but um, for whatever reason, uh, reading the tax forms for RESP over contributions, the wording is such that as long as the excess amount is withdrawn before the end of the month, there's no 1% penalty. Um, so just a weird, just a further complex, uh, complicate things. They've made even the over contributions on this plan different from the rest of registered plans, right? Um, yeah, and I think that's it. And then I just had that anecdote about the, the client of mine that used it for a bartending school, um, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I'll jump in here. Uh, you you had mentioned Mark about um, sometimes grandparents will open RESPs mm -hmm. for their grandkids. That's a strategy we've been asked about it. I tend to discourage it, and the reason is that unfortunately, the chances of a grandparent passing away before their grandchild has completed university is not remote. And if you are the subscriber of an RESP and you pass away, transferring that asset is not as straightforward as it is for many other account types. And so what I typically suggest in this situation is talk to your child and say, like, in other words, the parent, and say, we would like to fund an RESP for our grandchildren. We encourage you to open it up. I don't know, make it a holiday gift or something. You can fund it, but open it up in the parent's name. Mm -hmm. um, as far as possible. That also solves the problem that you had mentioned uh, about parents and grandparents, perhaps both opening mm -hmm. RESPs and accidentally over contributing. It's much yep. cleaner if the parent is the subscriber, preferably both parents as joint subscribers if possible. Yeah, that's a great point because unlike other registered plans, RESPs are subject to probate, right? Like they go through the will of the subscriber. If you have an RES, an RRSP or a TFSA and there's a named successor or a named beneficiary, it bypasses the, the estate on death. That's not the case with an RESP, even though it's also a registered plan. And so if you haven't named a successor subscriber to that plan in your will, your executor effectively takes ownership over the plan and needs to find somebody to take it over. And if there's nobody suitable, the, the executor could just decide to distribute the money, uh, pay the penalties and deal with it. Um, I haven't seen it happen, but it, to your point, it can, it can get really messy with the estate too. 
Yeah. And think about if, if, if the grandparent were to pass away, say just before or just after the child is enrolled in post-secondary education, by the time you get all this sorted out, mm -hmm. you know, it's quite possible the child would be in third, fourth year by now. And it, it's just really messy. Um, so it's so much cleaner if you can just arrange it so that the parents are joint subscribers, yep. you know, whenever that's yep. possible. For sure. Uh, can you open a joint account with the grandparents, like the parents and the grandparents? Would that help solve it? What's that? Would you, could you open an, an, a joint? Uh, you, uh, you can't. No, the, if you're go you can have joint subscribers on an RESP, but they have to be spouses. Right. So this is another interesting point. This has come up with us before. We've had clients where the parents are separated um, and they were joint subscribers. And even though they're both parents of the beneficiary, they cannot be joint subscribers once they are no longer spouses. Mm -hmm. So what we had to do was sever it. One parent became the subscriber and they just had an agreement. Fortunately, it was an amicable separation and they were just able to say, okay, your name is on it as the subscriber, but I will, you know, be as supportive as I can contribute some amount for the contributions, et cetera. So interesting adds yet another wrinkle into an already fairly complex plan. Yeah, well, and I've got one where they're, the parents are divorced, but each of them maintains an RESP for the beneficiary. So it was joint, they separated, but one of the spouses wouldn't give up their sort of control over the RESP or both, I guess. And so there's actually two RESPs, but I only deal with one of the, the separated spouses. And so I have absolutely no view, and neither does she, on what's going on in her ex-husband's RESP for their kids. And now the kids are going to university, and so it's becoming very difficult even for us as advisors like where do we take the, the money from right yeah yeah crazy how how many <clears throat> uh, downstream impl implications are with uh with resp planning and like uh estates and uh and family law stuff mm -hmm. I, I think w one one important nugget in there that we can maybe be explicit about is that if you want an resp account to go to somebody else as opposed to be distributed it's really important to have a successor subscriber named in your will yeah, because that's not something that you can do on the account, like with other registered account types. Yep, that's right. And that's something that I've seen missed many times for people mm -hmm. who have an RESP and are getting a will done. Uh, it's it's for whatever reason common to be overlooked uh, through throughout that process. Yep. Uh, asset allocation. Or do you want to talk about that other? Yeah, no, I think that's good. I think we've probably. Picked the, pick the part as much as we should for now. If we haven't discouraged uh, okay. everyone from opening an RESP, right, yeah. we will soon. Yeah. You know, well, Mark, you've made the point a few times that like it, it's it's not as restrictive as it's as it seems, and and like it's a lot easier to use than it seems, and whatever, whatever. But that argument is used. Uh, I've seen it used at least in one case when when people are trying to recommend permanent insurance instead of an RESP. That mm. flexibility argument is often used where, Ugh. you know, that someone will say, don't contribute to an RESP, contribute to a whole life policy because it's whatever. It's, uh, you get tax free growth, which is not true. Um, you get, uh, <laughs> uh, and then you don't have all these restrictions at the of end course. of the plan like you do with the RESP. But like, yes, there are restrictions on the RESP, but they're not that bad. Like they're relatively yeah. easy to manage. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a big deal. And we, and we have modeled that recently. Uh, Jason Prayer and I, for a project that we're working on, who? we modeled whole life insurance you against. Who, sorry? <laughs> that joke is so ridiculous. That, that this guy's kind of Jason. I don't know. You probably haven't heard of him. Um, yeah, some guy. So we 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 have this project uh, where we're looking at different cases for permanent insurance, and one of the ones we looked at is RESP versus whole life policy. Hmm. And because of the grants, mostly, um, there's, there's just no way that a whole life policy can match an RESP. Uh, unless you make some extreme assumptions about what happens at the end of the RESP plan, plan like, you know, all of the gains being uh, given back, for example, which obviously wouldn't look very good, but that's not a realistic mm -hmm. case either. Anyway, that was just a digression. Well, wow. uh, asset allocation for RESP. So this is, again, it's another thing where it's surprisingly complicated for what should be a relatively simple account. Uh, we've talked about how the money's got to come out of the RESP for it to be tax efficient in a pretty specific time frame, like while the student is enrolled in qualifying post-secondary education. So uh, I think one of the things that leads to people doing is, is thinking about their accounts asset allocation uh, as being tied very closely to when their student, uh, when their child is going to go to school. And I think that can make sense if the funds in the RESP are 
going to be used to fund, for like completely used to fund education costs. If you need the money in the account and it will be spent and given to an educational institution when the child is enrolled, <clears throat> then sure, it, it, it should follow some kind of glide path because you're really matching liabilities with that account, like no one liabilities. So Justin Bender at it, PWO. It, that just, just, I mean, that should be the assumption for most people, I think, right? I mean, again, we're, we, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. If you happen to be, you know, quite well off and are well able to fund your kids post-secondary education and are just using the RESP as a kind of tax shelter and then, then you're right. But I th think it's fair to say that that's not necessarily the majority of people. And for most people who are opening an RESP for the reason that it was presumably intended, I think you should probably go into it with the thought that there should be some kind of glide path where the asset allocation gets more conservative as you approach high school graduation. Yeah, I think that makes sense in uh, in general. I just think that, that it's not the only way to think about it. And in in our sample, where like you know at PWL we tend to deal with fairly affluent families, the the case of that's the the second case where they maybe have other wealth or income to fund education costs. Then the asset allocation doesn't necessarily need to be directly tied to the education costs. But but I agree, Dan. Like in in a, in a general case for the average person, yeah, it, it still makes sense. So Justin has a great, Justin Bender at PWL has a great post on this where he just kind of shows walking through that glide path where uh, your RESP starts out at 90% equity and then it decreases into incrementally shifting into bonds and eventually shifting into cash uh, in the years before the students enrolled. And so I think that makes a lot of sense. But then as I mentioned with Aaron's example, uh, in that case, some of the money was going into the TFSA and the FHSA, which depending on what the money is going to be used for, could continue to be in uh, long-term long -term investments. So I think that that could change the asset allocation target for the, uh, for the RESP account, because again, it's not actually being spent and withdrawn. So a little bit more volatility uh, wouldn't be as big of a deal. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of all. All my thoughts on RESP asset allocation. Hmm. So do you think the glide, so in, in a standard case, would you actually get more conservative year by year? Like I, I haven't read Justin's post in, in quite a while, but does he go year by year or does like, in my mind, I would probably go without looking at it hundred percent equity up until they're like 14 or 15, like a few years before, before I started a glide path. Like, so you wouldn't start a glide path from age five and start getting more conservative at that point. Right. In Justin's example, that that is what that mm -hmm. that is what he shows, but that that's not the only way to do it. I think just yeah. conceptually, you're you're wanting to get more conservative over, over time. Right. Yeah, I mean, I personally would go more conservative earlier than that, Mark. I mean, just by our nature, I think. But I don't think it needs to be done on a year by year basis, right? You're mm -hmm. thirty percent stocks this year and twenty five the next year, and tw like I think that's overdoing it. Right. Um, but it's funny because when we talk to clients about this, I tend to not recommend the 100% stock allocation even early on. Or if it is, it's only for the first, I don't know, six or seven years. I wouldn't go all the way to 14 just because, especially if they're not front loading it, right? If they're going to put in that $50,000 when the child's born, maybe. Um, but if you're just adding $2,500 a year plus the grant, said so like your investment returns are not really driving very much at that point because the dollar amounts are so small. Uh, it's your contributions and the grants that are really the most important factors. And so, you know, if you just, just use a balanced portfolio is probably, mm -hmm. you know, or the least volatile way to do it. But again, that's just the stylistic thing. I would, wouldn't argue that that's the only way to do it. Interesting. And, and it's interesting when we, because we, we talk to clients about risk tolerance and we use a, a risk tolerance tool that, that Ben, you and your research team built. But RESPs have always kind of, not confused me, but been an interesting conversation with clients because it's like whose risk tolerance matters the most for the RESP. And obviously it's the parents, but their timeline is constrained. And at the end of the day, if this really is going to fund the child's education, even though you're the owner of the account and the child's too young to have a, a risk tolerance per se, but the risk tolerance conversation, which usually is the constraint on how aggressive you can be with the portfolio, um, becomes really fascinating in those cases. Yeah, the time horizon there is more important than the client's temperament. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so... 
So I'm triple leverage NASDAQ in my RESP. I should <laughs> what is it? Q, Q, four Qs? Is it a... Q, 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 Q. Although I did find, apparently there's, this is a total digression, but there's a 5X leveraged NASDAQ ETP. I think, I don't know if it trades in Europe or something. I couldn't find it in Canada, but this thing exists. It's 5X NASDAQ. That's a good RESP vehicle, I would there say. Yeah. Super size RESP. So... All right. Are you going to allow me to climb on my soapbox for a minute here? Let's do it, Dan. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this was actually kind of one of the uh, the genesis of this discussion that we had was, um, you know, I have a number of issues, I think, with RESPs. And, um, you know, look, they, there's no question they have a lot of benefits. We've just cataloged them. If you're a parent who can afford to contribute to them, you absolutely should. I did for my kids. I don't regret it at all. Um, the The problems I have are just a little bit more about the uh, structure of them and some of the uh, government incentives. So um, I just want to make a few kind of constructive criticisms and hopefully somebody out there is listening. I mean, uh, let's start with the first one that I hope the objective of the RESP program was to assist families who would otherwise have been unable to afford tuition uh, and therefore, you know, increase the number of low income uh, families who um, are able to send their kids to school. If that is, in fact, the objective of the program, it's mostly failed. I mean, the research seems pretty clear. There's been a number of reports on this. RESPs are predominantly used by well-off families, most of whom would have probably been able to send their kids to school and assist them financially without the government's help. Um, and I, you know, there's some obvious reasons for that. Obviously, well-off families have more funds available for RESP contributions, but it's not just that. Um, another reason is that lower-income families may have less financial literacy, and they may just simply be unaware of RESPs. They might face barriers to opening the plans. They might, you know, be less comfortable dealing with investment firms or banks, uh, and therefore those programs may not be getting to the people who need them the most. Um, one sort of encouraging thing I was noticing that Ontario has now tried to address this issue by asking parents specifically if they would like to be referred to an RESP provider as part of their newborn registration service. So this is when you have a baby, um, you apply for the birth certificate and the social insurance number. And at that time, they will offer, if you want, without any sales pressure, because they don't have any vested interest, they will introduce you to an RESP promoter, either one that you choose. So you can go to them and say, hey, I would like to open an RESP with such and such an institution. And the government will then reach out to that financial institution and then invite them to contact you directly. So this is how they put it on their website. It says, you can consent to be contacted by an RESP promoter of your choice to learn about and to start to open an RESP if you decide to, and to request the Canada Learning Bond and or the Canada Education Savings Grant for your child. The service is quick and easy and puts the RESP promoter that you choose in direct contact with you to assist you to start saving early in an RESP for your child's education after high school. I think that's a pretty useful nudge. I don't know how successful it's been, but I like the idea and I would encourage other provinces to consider the same sort of thing. But I want to look at another issue with RESP accessibility. And Ben, this is one that you touched on in your introduction, and that is that RESP providers um, are sometimes what are called group RESPs or pooled RESPs. And these include a few different companies, Children Education Funds, Canada's or Canadian Scholarship Trust, Heritage Education Funds. There's a few others. Now, if there is a benefit of one of these plans is that they don't require you to work with an intimidating financial advisor, you know, like Mark or someone here at PWL. Um, and you don't need to have any investment know-how. You just need to sign up. Uh, you subscribe, basically. You make monthly contributions. You get all the bonds and grants that you're eligible for. They do all of that administration for you and they administer the funds. So in theory, that's a benefit. But the problem is these plans have really been widely criticized for being aggressively marketed to new parents. Uh, ben, you mentioned, and I've heard these stories for years, of course, of them going into hospital maternity wards and, you know, sort of pressuring new parents to, to sign up. Um, but even more problematic, I think, is the way they're structured because these pool plans are designed so if you subscribe and then you decide for whatever reason to cancel, 
the penalties are very high and a lot of your money ends up staying in the plan and it subsidizes people who don't drop out. And not surprisingly, the people who are most likely to drop out after subscribing tend to be low income families simply because they can't afford to continue the contributions that they had committed to. So here, here's a uh, paragraph from a report about this problem. It says, redistribution of earnings on contributions from subscribers who exit the plans early to those who stay to maturity is integral to the design of group plan RESPs. There are concerns that low income subscribers may be more likely to exit these plans prior to maturity or prior to their beneficiaries accessing the full complement of payments. This is a pretty heartbreaking report, I think, because it's like a survival of the fittest approach to education. I mean, this is hardly advances the goal of fairer access to education when it has you know, presumably lower income families contributing, dropping out, not benefiting from it, and then their money going to higher income families who keep subscribing right to maturity. I, this is a problem for me. I don't like the way that those plans are structured for that reason. All right. So then the next problem with RESPs I want to address is the inadequacy of the incentives for low income families who participate because there are some promising plans we've talked about the canada learning bond for example uh, again just a reminder if you're a qualifying low income family you can get up to two thousand dollars without making any contributions yourself you get five hundred dollars just for opening the resp and you get another hundred hundred dollars annually until the child is 15 if you continue to qualify. The government even chips in 25 bucks to help cover the cost of opening the account. So it's lovely. But we can all agree $2,000, which by the way, has not increased since 2004, right, is not even enough to pay for a single semester of an undergraduate program. So I'm not really sure that this meaningly improves the prospects for post-secondary education for any child in a low-income family. They might open the RESP, they might get a couple of thousand dollars, but that's not likely to make uh, an otherwise unobtainable goal any closer to reality. More than that too, there's a significant obstacle in that receiving the Canada Learning Bond you requires you to actually open an RESP. Now, that might sound simple for our listeners, but families with lower financial literacy are going to have more difficulty with this step. Right? It's not necessarily as straightforward as, as you know, those who are more financial, financially savvy might think. And so there have been critics of the CLB program who have suggested that low-income families would be better served if financial assistance for education wasn't tied specifically to the RESP program. Right? So there's different ways you could do it. The federal government could deposit the entitlement into some kind of notional account. This could be administered alongside the Canada Child Benefit, which is another income-tested benefit. So there are alternatives. Um, Mark, I did want to say when we were prepping for the show, you had pointed out that in uh, the current uh, federal budget, there was a proposal for something that might help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this this was budget 2024. And Starting in 2028-2029, the proposal is that all eligible children born after two, or in 2024 or later would have an RESP plan automatically opened for them. And if they were eligible for the Canada Learning Bond payments, that would be automatically deposited into their accounts. And I believe it's done or proposed in such a way that uh, if the child attains the age of four and they don't yet have an RESP, then they will automatically open one for them, right? So it does step in the right direction for sure, right? At least it's going to get some of that um, that Canada Learning Bond money that people would otherwise qualify for that they don't know about or they don't have the financial literacy to go and open an account themselves. That will partially solve it. But I mean, there's four years there where they're not going to be getting it in, that, in those cases. I don't know what institution is going to end up administering all of these. I don't know how that money is going to get invested, if at all. I, I believe just it'll probably end up sitting in cash or in a savings account of some kind. But at least they are thinking about the the concerns that you've you've raised to some degree, Dan. Yeah, I mean these are at least kind of good ideas. We'll see what the execution is actually like. Right? But um, so anyway, so that's the Canada Learning Bond. We've also mentioned that the CESG grants or the the standard grants, uh, they're uh, the matching grants on your contribution. 
uh, will get topped up for low income families who have RESPs. But I see this benefit as pretty problematic as well. I mean, so here's how it works, right? When you contribute $2,500 to an RESP, you typically get a grant of 20%, $500. However, Lower income families also get what's called additional CS, CESG. So instead of the usual grant of $500, they would get $600. So again, that's nice, but here's the problem. To qualify for that full top up, your net family income can't be more than $55,867 in 2024. That number changes with inflation. And if your family income is greater than that, but not more than $111,733, you still get some additional CESG, but it's only 10%. So on that $2,500 contribution, your grant would be $550 instead of $500. If it's over that $111,733, you get no additional grants. So it's also important to, you know, as Ben pointed out, these additional grants, yes, they can be obtained with smaller contributions if you qualify, but lower income families are not able to collect any more grant money over the life of the RESP. The maximum lifetime grant any child can receive is still $7,200, including the standard amount and the additional CESG. And so that's important. You're not getting you know, any additional money. You're just getting it with lower contributions. Right? And th these are tens of dollars that we're talking about. Right, like to your point, a family with you know income of say fifty five thousand or even under one hundred eleven thousand, they might not be maxing out an RESP, and if they're getting a ten or twenty percent bonus on a thousand or fifteen hundred dollar contribution up and above the grant that they would already get, we're talking like thirty dollars a year in some cases. It's really meaningless at the end of the day. Pretty trivial amounts, and and even with the trivial benefit. I mean, let's look at these very low income thresholds, right? Households earning less than $55,000 a year cannot be expected to direct any meaningful amount of savings into an RESP. There's, it's very unlikely that they're going to be contributing that $2,500 and collecting the whole additional $100 in grants, right? Most people in Canada, most families are going to have a pretty hard time just paying the rent and putting food on the table at that point. And so you have to be really low income in order to benefit from these. And if you are, you probably don't have $2,500 to put into an RESP, right? And I mean, at the risk of, you know, getting hate mail from seniors, I'm going to put my neck out here and say, you know, the government is removing this very modest benefit from families with a combined income of less than $56,000, but it continues to pay old age security benefits to seniors until their individual incomes, not household incomes, exceed $148,000 in 2024. So I'm just putting it out there that maybe RESP grants could be calculated on the basis of income and reduced you know, or even eliminated for families who don't need them, but with thresholds that are more in line with those used to claw back old age security. So I don't know. I don't have the answers here, but I'm suggesting that maybe if you earn $200,000 a year, you don't get any RESP grant. But if you earn $50,000 a year, you get a very generous RESP grant, right? So then the grant money is going to the families who really need it and not just acting as a kind of additional tax sheltered account for families who don't really need it. Interesting. And your number there on the old age security, 148,000, that's the point at which the last dollar of OAS gets clawed back. So yeah. at that point, you're still getting some OAS. Yeah. You're not getting the full amount, but yes. That's Does that number answer. presume you took it at age 65? Uh, yes. And it, well, I don't think it matters the age you took it. It matters the age you are, right? So if you're over 75, that threshold goes up because you're Old age security is 10% right. higher. Yeah, I'm just thinking if you defer it, and this is also something that Aaron Hector pointed out to me once once upon a time, but if you defer it because your OAS is higher, um, you can actually have more taxable income before the entire amount gets clawed back, right? Because it gets clawed back at 15 cents per dollar. So the yeah, higher your OAS, the higher yeah. the income you can actually have before it all gets clawed back. So my point is that if you were to defer OAS, that ceiling is not necessarily 148,000. It could be, I don't know what it, it is, called 160, 170. You got yeah. a couple, that's three hundred and forty, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars of household income and you might still get a penny of old age security. 
to your point now, people with $55,000 of household income are losing this tens of dollars of benefit. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just a yawning gap, I think, between those two thresholds and something that uh, just really jumps out to me. If you want to get money in the hands of families who need it, and, you know, let's face it, RESPs, you know, funding education is an investment in the future, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just a handout. It's something that benefits everybody to have a more educated populace and workforce. So. Yep. Right. So look, I've spent a lot of time ripping on RESPs and their flaws. I, I want to end with some more positive observations because as I said, I, I, I love the idea of them. Uh, and just because they have some structural limitations, it doesn't mean they're accounts that people should avoid. Um, you know, let's start with the first one. If you are able to take advantage and you contribute that $2,500 annually, and lots of sort of middle income families can do that and do that um, on a regular basis. Uh, and you max all the government grants, that RESP really does become a pretty significant asset. Um, even with modest investment returns, it's quite realistic. We see it all the time for um, parents to save seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 or even more by the time their child starts university. And that is likely to cover most of an undergrad degree, I think, depending on what course you take, of course, or whether you live at home or what your needs are for room and board. But that is certainly a very good start. And I have worked with many parents who are really pleased to achieve that goal for their kids. Um, the The first time you have a child graduate high school and, you know, they look at that RESP and they say, do you think that's going to cover their education? And I'm able to say, yes, if not all of it, certainly the bulk of it. Um, they're very proud of that financial goal and they should be. So they're definitely a boon for, for people who have the means and the savvy to use them to their full potential. We did for both of our kids, they were a huge help in, uh, in paying for their education. So, you know, I think big picture, they're, they're, uh, very useful accounts, right? Um, and I, I want to say too, I think it's, it's important, even though I've been complaining about how the RESP program has not really improved over the last 20 years or so, this contribution limit is basically the same as it was. That lifetime maximum grant has been $7,200, it seems like forever. Um, there's been no indexation on, on any of these limits. But I think it's worth noting that one of the reasons for that, and one of the reasons that the government has clearly stopped improving the RESP program, is because governments have introduced other policies that have improved access to education, tuition freezes, more generous financial assistance for low-income families. So they are in many ways doing the right thing. And as a result, Canada actually now leads all G7 countries with almost 60% of its workforce holding bachelor's degrees or higher. So we are doing a lot of things right. Just not convinced that RESPs can take too much credit for that. Yeah, that's all. That's fair. I think the only thing that I can remember is this budget was it this budget or last year they actually increased we talked about the eap limit in that first semester of being eight thousand dollars for full-time um, full-time school and four thousand for part-time school it actually used to be five thousand for full-time and twenty five hundred for part-time um, so this isn't really a big deal but they recently increased the amount that you could take out as a taxable withdrawal during the first 13 weeks not a big deal but it's you know some minor improvement to the withdrawal Wow. Yeah, because that actually that five thousand dollar limit in the first thirteen weeks was pretty limiting. I know that for a lot of times we would have preferred to be able to take more. Yeah, I was. I, I think it seems clear to me that the reason, the primary reason that that limits there is so people don't game the system by, you know, enrolling their child in a program, withdrawing all of the grants and growth, and then dropping out six months later. Um, right. So, I mean, you could still game the system, but it's just a little harder now with that, with that cap. Great. No, nope. very, very valid points and criticisms down. Um, I, I think like in my experience, I've never seen a situation where an RESP ended up being the wrong, a bad tool in, in hindsight. I think, to, you know, people do, or pe people worry about some of the restrictions that we talked about that are mostly overblown and are concerned about withdrawal strategies and what if their kids don't go to school. I have not once in 15 years come across a scenario where with the client, we looked at the RESP when their kids were about to go to university and went, or even of university age and went, oh boy, like this was a really, really bad idea in hindsight. So I'm just curious if either of you have come across bad experiences with clients and RESPs. 
I, I had one, um, it just happened to us last year. Uh, again, this was not something that I, I think in hindsight, we could look back and said, well, we shouldn't have done it. Um, but we did run into one of the limitations that we couldn't overcome. That was, we opened the RESP for the family. They have uh, two kids. Um, we contributed the max every year. Uh, I think we even did the supercharge 14,000. Um, and then the family moved out of Canada. Mm -hmm. And they were pretty sure that just for the record, you don't have to collapse an RESP if you move out of Canada. But if the child is not a resident of Canada, they cannot claim those uh, benefits. So they said the chances of our kids going to post-secondary school while they're like moving back to Canada and becoming a student there was remote. So we just agreed we would have to collapse the RESP and you know, the usual things happen. We got the contribution rooms, our contributions back. Mm -hmm. We had to repay the grants to the government. Fine. Yeah. But then all the growth on the investment, we could not withdraw. And the reason was the plan had not been open for 10 years. You'll mm -hmm. remember that one uh, limitation we talked about. And because of that, we had to just make a donation to a post-secondary education. So they were very grateful for the <laughs> donation. Uh, no tax receipt was issued. Um, so, you know, worst case scenario, they, they got back their contributions. They definitely lost a few years of investment growth. It was some opportunity cost. I just, I don't know. I mean, what do you do when you ask a family, would you like to open an RESP? Do you think, is there any chance that someday, years from now, you might move out of the country? Yeah, or your I kids. Mean, yeah, so hindsight, I don't think there's anything we did wrong, but just to let you know, there, you know, there can be situations where you end up disappointed that you have to uh, dissolve the plan. Mm. Very interesting. Mm. All right, <clears throat> I think that's it for uh, for our ESPs. Should we go into the after show? Sure, sounds good. I don't watch any content. Cameron always has content that he talks about. I don't know. Do you guys watch any shows or anything that were that were good? Shows? No. Man, you guys, you guys are like me. <laughs> Who's got time for shows? Like Cameron. When Cameron does. I Did you up, watch this? I'm like, no, I didn't no, watch that. Not. He doesn't have young kids anymore. That's why he's got all the time in the world. Yeah, maybe. Uh, okay, so no, no content. That's that's pretty funny. No, I'm reading. I'm reading a Star Wars book. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah. The original. Yeah. No, well, there's so I didn't. I mean, Star Wars isn't actually based on a book, but um, in between two of the movies, I don't remember which ones now, but there was this lull where there was like not a lot of Star Wars content coming out, and I think Lucasfilms, their licensing company, said like we need to put out some Star Wars stuff, but we're not going to put out a new movie. So they went and found a publisher to find an author to write books in the Star Wars universe. So it's cool mm. because it has all the characters um, from the the original movies. There's just a totally different timeline and, and story for them. So it's, um, I can't remember what it's called, Hair to the Empire, Hair to the Throne, something like that. But um, yeah, I read fantasy novels at night before bed, and that's about all the content I consume these days that's not financially related. Well, there you go. That, that's, that's the, I filled the content slot. You did there it. you go. Somebody's got to do it. Uh, we got a, a review here. Uh, it's, uh, Related to Dan, which is nice. Says, thank you, Dan. Wow, it's so refreshing to hear Dan Bordelotti's voice again. The CCP podcast was one of the first pieces of content that got me into sensible financial advice. And hearing, hearing him again is like a warm, comforting hug. Please don't let him leave. <laughs> Sorry, Dan, you're stuck. Uh-oh. <laughs> and, uh, well, I always like to be able to offer warm hugs. So, <laughs> so uh, that's well, the only review. those kind words. Oh, yeah, super nice. Uh, that was the only review though. Uh, we, we always appreciate reviews. We have, uh, 1,234 ratings on Apple podcasts now, which is, I mean, pretty crazy. I used to think it'd be crazy if we got to a hundred, hmm. uh, with an average rating of 4.9 stars. And we've got 1200 ratings on Spotify with an average five star rating. Wow. Uh, so if you're listening and have not yet left a review, we would love to hear from you. It's always nice to read those. It really is. Uh, I also had someone reach out to me on Twitter. I sent this to you, Dan. Uh, they said, hi, Ben, great work on the Rational Reminder podcast. Just wanted to say that Dan is awesome. He really adds value to the podcast. Well-spoken, mature, and sensible. Thank you. Thank you. Also, very nice. I strive to be all of those things. You know, you are. I would have lis listening to some of the, your comments when we're doing the RESP episode. And it's like, you know, that's, 
it's a really sensible way to think about that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it comes from I think you know being a a background as as a communicator as opposed to in the financial industry. I just I have a little different perspective to a lot of these things. I think. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it's, sometimes it's helpful and sometimes it resonates with listeners, readers, clients. Yeah. Yeah. You know. well, I, yeah. More, more than sometimes I would estimate, but yep, I agree. Yeah. That's great. Lots of positive comments for, for Dan. Hey, you, you got a bunch of positive comments nice. and you started too, Mark, <laughs> but no longer. All good. These will dissipate very quickly. I'm that's, sure. Yeah. That's great. That's great to have you done. I think it adds a lot to a lot to the conversation for sure. Thank you. It's definitely yeah, nice yeah, to be yeah. back in it for sure. Yeah, no, it's good. Uh, okay, so I did want to comment on this discussion in the Rational Marketer community uh, that unfolded over the last kind of couple of weeks on expected returns. Like, what is an expected return? What determines expected returns? Do value stocks have higher expected returns? That was a big part of the discussion. Uh, so that that's it's it's in the Sunil Wahal episode. If people want to check it out, uh, when I last checked, it was up to three hundred and thirteen posts, but that was a while ago. It's probably more now. Uh, I'm not going to go over the whole discussion because it was like some of it's like, man, it's just a lot of text, walls and walls of text. Maybe think of that meme. I don't know if you ever, guys ever see that that meme that's like, it's like a screenshot of someone's like texting and it says, I ain't reading all that. I'm happy for you though, or sorry that happened. Yeah. Top, <laughs> that's how I felt like trying meme. to keep up with this thread. It was just like, man, it's something like the weekend too. People are writing these like essays. It's just like, wow, like good, good. For, I'm impressed, I guess. I don't know. I don't mean to be disrespectful of the efforts people put into that conversation, but it's just like, man, it's a lot of, a lot of text. Uh, but anyway, a lot of the discussion was around how cash flow growth affects expected returns. Uh, so w- instead of trying to recount the whole discussion or even give my views on what people were saying, because I there's just so much going on in there. Uh, what I did is took one post from one community member who I think is generally very very sensible uh, and well informed, and I'm I'm just going to take some of the points that he made. So we linked to an AQR presentation on on this topic that shows that the price of a stock uh, equals its expected cash flows discounted back to, to today's dollars at a discount rate that is equal to the expected return. I mean that's it. That's like fundamental asset pricing theory, discounted future cash flows. And then he makes the comment that if two companies, A and B, have the same expected cash flows and company A has a lower price than company B, then company A, like definitionally, mathematically, it's an equality, has has a higher expected return, a higher discount rate. That must be true just the way that that the math works. Now that's true whether cash flow growth, expected cash flow growth is zero, for company A and B, or if it's 10% for both companies. So cash flow growth does not affect that. Um, then he also makes a comment that when cash flow growth gets included in, in the equation, uh, the, the, the price can be simp- the, the stock's price mathematically can be simplified down to expected return equals expected cash flows over price plus expected growth. And that's like the Gordon growth model for stock valuation that uh, people may have may have heard of. So I think, th- and this poster was saying, that's where some of the confusion comes in because now we have growth as one of the terms in the equation. Uh, so how does that affect expected returns? <clears throat> so using that same example, if two companies, A and B, have the same expected cash flow, and maybe we can put the equation in, in the video so people can see what I'm talking about because it's probably hard to <laughs> think about. Uh, if two companies, A and B, have the same expected cash flows, so the same initial cash flow and the same expected cash flow growth into the future, and company A has a lower price than company B, then company A, again, must have a higher expected return, a higher discount rate, and that's true regardless of the growth assumption. It's the same in, in both cases. Uh, so he's basically saying, mathematically, it must be true that cash flow growth uh, doesn't somehow magically change expected returns. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the challenges, though, I think, is that in those equations, we're assuming that cash flows and cash flow growth are known quantities. But in reality, it's really hard to disentangle cash flow expectations and discount rates and expected returns when we're, when we're looking at, at stock prices. Like, for example, does NVIDIA have a high relative price because of insanely high cash flow expectations? And it still has a high discount rate, which is possible, and, and therefore still a high expected return? Or 
Does it have reasonable cash flow expectations and a really low discount rate, meaning a low expected return? It's, it's really hard to say what's going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you have papers like Fama and French's The Anatomy of Value and Growth Stock Returns. It's an older paper, so there's always that this time is different argument, but they, they break down the average returns of value and growth stocks into dividends and then three sources of capital gain. So it's like, where are the returns actually coming from for these different types of stocks? Uh, the three sources of capital gain are growth in book equity from earnings retention, convergence in price to book ratios, which is like uh, mean reversion in, uh, or it's coming from mean reversion in profitability and expected returns. And then the third source of capital gains is upward drift in the price to book ratio during the period in their, in their sample. Uh, so they find that the capital gains of value stocks trace mostly to convergence. So that's price to book rises as some value companies become more profitable and their stocks move to lower expected return groups, like they become growth stocks, for example. Uh, growth in the book value of equity is not meaningful for value por portfolios, but is a large positive factor in the capital gains for growth stocks. And then for growth stocks, convergence is negative. So valuation ratios fall because growth companies do not always remain highly profitable with low, uh, with low discount rates. Uh, they also show that in the year after stocks are allocated to value portfolios, growth in book equity is on average minor for large cap stocks and negative for small cap value stocks. Uh, it's basically saying that value stocks don't do a lot of equity financed investment. Uh, and then the large capital, a large average capital gains of value stocks show up as increases in the price to book ratio. Uh, and, and then in contrast, companies uh, invest heavily after they're allocated to growth portfolios. And on average, the growth rate of book equity uh, actually exceeds the growth rate of the stock price. So that means the price to book declines after stocks move to the growth category. And the, uh, the positive average rates of capital gain of growth portfolios trace back to increases in book equity uh, that more than offset the declines in, in price to book. As I'm reading this, I'm realizing it's probably way too nerdy. We did an episode <laughs> of this a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, there, there's this convergence that we see in valuations for growth stocks. So uh, once a stock becomes a growth stock, there tends to be a convergence back down to, uh, to a lower valuation at some point. And that has a big impact on the returns of growth stocks. And then it's kind of the opposite for value stocks. Once a stock becomes really cheap, it tends to do a little bit better at some point in the future. And that's one of the reasons that we see historically that there's been a, uh, a value premium. Um, yeah, as it relates to expected returns, you look at that, you look at what has happened in the past and you see a stock with a high price and ask that question, does it have a high expected return and really high cash flow expectations or does it have a low expected return and uh, reasonable cash cash flow expectation or yeah, reasonable cash flow expectations. It's still really hard to disentangle that, but I think it is interesting to look at that anatomy of what actually tends to happen with growth stocks, which kind of mm -hmm. suggests that they probably don't have high expected returns, unless unless this time is different, unless companies are different now and whatever, whatever. That that argument is always is always there, and we we can't know obviously if this time is is different. Um, anyway, that's, that's it. Expected returns or discount rates. The, the, the end basically. Yeah. But what does this mean for my five X leveraged NASDAQ position? That's all well, I really it, care about. I didn't yeah, hear so, anything you just said. It's I mean, tell me it, what to do with it. it. It probably has a low expected return. Yeah. But this is, this, this was the point of discussion. This was the, the point of contention in this community dis discussion is do high price stocks have low expected mm -hmm. returns? Mm-hmm. And it's a, the argument is that, well, today's companies are, are, they've got such incredible cash flow expectations because yeah. they're, you know, it's a winner take all environment and so on and so forth. So therefore we can have high price stocks that still have high expected returns. Mm -hmm. hmm. And is, is that true? I mean, if you look again, if you look at the past, that has not been true. Companies with long prices. Past. What's that? Like the long past, but I guess over the 10 years or so, the most recent 10 years. The last like 10 it. years, I mean, it's valuations have just gone up. Yeah. So maybe it is different. Like, All right, I'm, I'm sticking with my NASDAQ position. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for talking <laughs> me through that. I agree with all of yeah. that. Yep. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> I'm happy for you, though. Yeah. Uh.
Yeah. We're sorry that happened to you. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I felt like I had to say something about that discussion because it became such a thing in the rational matter community. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's it. We did talk about the anatomy of value and growth stock returns and another related Fama and French paper uh, called Migration. And the both of them just kind of look at why has there historically been a value premium? Like why have growth stocks underperformed and value stocks outperformed, relatively speaking? Um, like when you dig into the actual components of what drove that. So that's episode 140. We, uh, we talked about that. But I still don't know the answer. Do value stocks have higher expected returns than growth stocks or... or, or do do the differences in valuations predict differences in expected returns when we don't know what cash flows are? It's, it's a pretty interesting question. Mm -hmm. But there is no answer. No, there's no answer. Nope. Uh, I mean, all right, that's it. So uh, as always, let us know what you thought of the episode. It's a, again, a bit of a different thing uh, where we covered a relatively Canadian topic and talked through some... I don't know, di different, different kinds of stuff. Like Dan's mm -hmm. soapbox segment was, uh, that's, that's a new thing. I don't thanks do much for, soapbox. Uh, thanks for letting me uh, get off the leash on that one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's been well, bottling we talking, up for a long time. So we were talking earlier before, I guess after we recorded the last episode about, um, maybe doing a series on the different types of accounts in Canada, like RSPs and tax, tax free savings accounts and non-registered investment accounts, registered disability savings plans. So again, very, very Canadian content, but I'm very curious to hear what listeners think about this episode, because that will probably inform our decision on whether we do deep dives on the other account types as well. Right. Yeah, yeah definitely appreciate the feedback. We've got some other stuff cooking too. Like I, I just wrote a video that we can talk about in the podcast too, on uh, what's related to actually what we were just talking about. Can you pick, winning industries like can you identify which industry is going to perform well in the future before the fact can i because i bought marijuana stocks in 2017 so i personally cannot but <laughs> you're, you're hilarious man you do all the stuff that like the the silly average investor does totally i mean most of my portfolio is totally hands-off right but you gotta you gotta scratch the itch a little bit you gotta have some fun right uh, i don't i don't have that itch but no you don't i know you don't you're a cyborg you wouldn't have that itch I'm glad you do it, I guess. Do it for all I of us. If I want to get really <laughs> crazy, I buy a three-year GIC. Three, yeah. three years, Dan? Three oh years. Oh my goodness, that right. is nuts. Yeah. Wow. Leveraged. <laughs> 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 so I'm not I'm sharing that leveraged. strategy with anybody, though. I'm keeping it to myself. Yeah, I hope you don't get margin called. You've got no liquidity on that, Dan. So. The, pr the price doesn't move. I think you're, you're, you're good, right? That's yeah. true, yeah. <laughs> no volatility. I got it figured out. Oh, it's not a market link to you, I see, I hope. But. Nope. Nice. Okay, anyways. All right, I think that's uh, that's good for the episode. But yeah, I'm saying it, I'm repeating myself, but de definitely interested in feedback on uh, on the topic. Uh, but we, I, we do have some more traditional topics that we can do uh, in, in future episodes, like the uh, picking winning industries one. I've got, a, I've got something cooking on gold too. There's been some interesting research that's come out on gold uh, since the last time we covered that topic. Working on that. Working on a few other things too. But, uh, yep. All right. Anything else from you guys? No, that's it. Thanks. Awesome.